once I check into my new room, I'm thinking about heading off to see the U Sant Museum here in Yangon. I wanted to go there a few days ago, but it turns out it's only open on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and today is Friday. We're kind of moving into a festival weekend, like a holiday weekend, so there's a chance it will be closed. But from everything I saw online, it's uh, supposed to be open. No matter how many times I walk by the Sule Pagoda, it always strikes me as an astonishing sight right here in the middle of the city. How many times do you see a pagoda like that as a main roundabout for a major city? That was very cool. And I guess the uh, British set it up that way. When they uh, redesigned the city, you know, they set up all the roads on a grid pattern to go around this uh, exact spot. I mentioned that I might go to see the U Thant Museum this afternoon. And uh, I'm a little bit distracted right now because I'm walking down a kind of busy district with my backpack on my back, heading to a new hotel. But this might be a good time to uh, talk about who Uthant is and why I want to go to his museum. Uthant is something of a national hero here in Myanmar, and for very good reason. He was the first non-European Secretary General of the United Nations. He was the third Secretary General of the UN, from Myanmar, of course. He was born in a, a small town in the Irrawaddy Delta. Um, somewhat humble beginnings, I suppose, but he went on to be basically the world's top diplomat. And that is a, quite an accomplishment especially when you consider the period in which he was the Secretary General. He was elected unanimously in uh, 1961 to replace uh, Dag Hammarskjöld. He was the uh, previous uh, Secretary General and he was killed in a plane crash and Uthant was elected to replace him. Uthant served two terms from 1961 to 1971. He was elected unanimously again for his second term and he ended up setting the record for the longest you know, term as Secretary General of the UN at uh, 10 years and uh, one month. All of that on its own would be enough to get anybody their own museum. But on top of all that, he was Secretary General in the 60s and uh, he had to deal with some of the major world crises that we know about in the 20th century. He dealt with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, civil war in the Congo. Bit of a busy area here, a lot of buses. The Six Day War uh, with Israel. The Vietnam War. He was quite an outspoken critic of uh, U.S. policy during the Vietnam War. He was a keen environmentalist, as far as I know. In addition to having to deal with all of those uh, problems with uh, some of the major powers on the planet. Whoa. <laughs> He was also Secretary General during a period when a lot of uh, new countries were emerging, like newly independent countries from Asia and from Africa. Um, they were all becoming independent from the colonial time, and these new countries were applying for a membership in the United Nations. So there was a lot of changes going on around the world and in the UN. So it's an extraordinary time to be the Secretary General. And from all accounts, uh, Uthant did a remarkable uh, job. I watched a few uh, videos on YouTube of Uthant uh, giving speeches. And he struck me as a very thoughtful, 
well-spoken man, slow in his speech, but he spoke uh, very good English. When he was a student, he was an avid reader, read everything he could get his hands on, and because of that and his uh, thoughtful demeanor, he earned the reputation among his friends as and the nickname of uh, the philosopher, and that seems to uh, suit him. The Uthant Museum is housed in a residence where Uthant lived in the 50s when he served as, I believe, secretary to the then uh, president of Myanmar. So he lived there throughout the 50s, um, just before he moved to New York to enter you know, his term as a you know, representative of Myanmar in the United Nations. I believe that was in 1957. And then in 61 was the year he was elected uh, Secretary General. The house is uh, located in what they call the Windermere compound. And apparently this is an area where a lot of the uh, leaders of Myanmar had homes or perhaps still have homes today, I'm not sure. It's started to rain since I checked into my room, so I'm uh, heading to Utant House still, but I'm not going to walk there this time. I'm going to uh, take a grab, and the receptionist from Lotus Hospitality, he ordered one for me, so things should be a little bit more organized this time <laughs> than me trying to do it myself. So yeah, we're just waiting for the grab to come uh, pick me up. It's like six or seven kilometers away. It's going to cost uh, 4,000 chat which is two and a half dollars, I guess, something like that. Uh, so the grab is a, a taxi again. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that worked out really well in the uh, taxi heading to Utant house. I think the receptionist was pronouncing it Utant instead of Thant. So Utant, maybe I'll find out when I get to uh, the museum. I don't think the museum itself will be, you know, extraordinary. It might be very similar to Bojok Ongsan's museum, which is essentially, you know, the house where he used to live. So you don't see a lot there other than, you know, this is the desk that he, you know, Uthant used to sit in. This is the bed he slept in, you know, that kind of thing. But going to a museum like this gives you a good excuse to learn about someone like Uthant. Um, and as I said in my, as I hope I got across in my summary before, is he lived uh, quite an extraordinary life. Um, I can't imagine what it, uh, you know, would have been like to uh, be born in a small town in the Irrawaddy Delta in uh, Myanmar. And uh, next thing you know, you are, you know, the Secretary General of the United Nations dealing with John F. Kennedy and Castro and uh, Khrushchev, I believe, over the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, intervening in a civil war in the Congo, the Six Day War. I mean, it's just, uh, he was Secretary General during an extraordinary period of history. So it's really uh, quite something that uh, he's from Myanmar, and I think people here are quite proud of him. It's quite funny, we're passing right by Kandaji Lake that I walked to just the other day. So we're basically right back where I started from a couple of days ago. You can see the lake there with the, uh, the walkway, the boardwalk that I walked all the way around the lake on. But I'm very glad to be in a grab today because for whatever reason on that walk, I ripped my toes apart. I had a huge blisters all over my toes and by the time I was done with that walk, I uh, could barely even uh, move anymore. Actually, I knew my uh, foot was really in a lot of pain when I was uh, finishing that walk that day when I went to see the reclining Buddha. I was really just hobbling around. But it wasn't until I got back to the uh, guest house 
and then I got a close look at my feet and I saw just how much damage I had done. I had no idea it was so bad. On one toe, like all the skin was gone, like the bottom and one whole side just completely ripped off. The whole toe was bare. I had no idea it was that bad. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm keeping an eye on it right now, keeping it clean and uh, applying band-aids and I don't want it to get any more raw than it is but there was no way I could walk another uh, six kilometers today. And all roads seem to lead you past a Schwedagon Pagoda at one point or another. There it is up there on the left. You got a lot of shops here selling uh, statues and Buddhist objects. And we seem to have ducked down some small back roads just to get around uh, Schwedegon Pagoda perhaps. The traffic might be really busy around the uh, pagoda. And we've uh, found a, a shortcut to try and bypass it, I think. We arrived at Uthant House. It's right there. Very simple looking house in a way from the outside. Very pleasant here. There goes my grab. It's interesting that the grab cars here tend to be uh, taxis. So when I go out onto the street and I order a grab, you know, I'm sort of looking for cars, like non-taxi cars, and I'm looking all over the place. Where's my grab? Where's my grab? And there'll be a taxi sitting right in front of me, and it turns out that that taxi is uh, my grab. So there's the house there. And I saw on the sign at the front a little bit of an unpleasant surprise that the entrance fee for this place is uh, 10,000 chat for foreign visitors. A little bit excessive for just going into a house, but we'll see. Maybe uh, it will impress me so much, I will think it is worth every one of those 10,000 chats. We'll have to see whether I can bring in a camera or not. It would be annoying if they uh, had a rule, you know, no uh, cameras. So there it is. Children under 12 are free and foreign visitors, 10,000 chat. Very quiet out here. Let's head on in. And this uh, kind of summarizes what I was saying uh, earlier, that U Thant is known to the world as the third Secretary General of the United Nations, serving two terms during the globally turbulent period from 61 to 71. And this house was U Thant's home from 51 to 57, when he was uh, an official in the government. You know, when I think about his life and his term as a Secretary General, I'm not really thinking that much about the uh, politics of the era. I'm not a very political person. But what interests me is the change in life circumstances. You know, my own personal life is such a simple, ordinary one, you know, with nothing that special. And yet, so I can't imagine what it's like to, you know, be someone who goes on to become the Secretary General, you know, of the United Nations and play such a central role in world affairs. You know, some people are born and they, you know, live a, a normal, happy life. You know, they're bus drivers, teachers, whatever they are. And yet some people become head of the World Bank, you know, president of a country, millionaires or billionaires. And that change, you know, from being, you know, just a guy going to high school and next thing you know, he's leading the United Nations. You know, what does that feel like to experience that? 
I have to become this person. I've seen that photograph uh, quite a few times and that suits his nickname of uh, the philosopher. He definitely looks like he uh, was reading a book and after they take the picture he's going to go back and uh, read another one. I'm feeling like a, a tour leader now. I have a school group coming up behind me. There you go. <clears throat> the story that I read here is kind of a common one in Myanmar, it seems, that a lot of the you know, leaders of the country were not that popular with the uh, military government. So here it says that after Uthan died, um, the Revolutionary Council of General Ne Win you know, would not give him any uh, special honors. And he was very popular with the people, but the government didn't do anything, you know, to provide a state funeral or anything like that. A group of students seized the coffin and buried it on the grounds of the university. And the students stood vigil there, gave anti-government speeches, and Uthan's family tried to negotiate between them and the government. And then finally, soldiers stormed the campus, killed a bunch of students. Then they took the coffin and uh, reburied it at uh, Shwedagon Pagoda. And I guess it's still there uh, to this day. That's a very interesting story. And his life was somewhat tragic because he retired from the UN in 71. I believe he was offered a third term and he refused it and he might have done so because he was so tired. It says here he was exhausted and had frail health. Um, so he retired in 71, but then he passed away in 1974 from uh, lung cancer at the age of uh, 65. He did write his uh, memoirs, I guess, View from the UN, but considering the life that he led. It's unfortunate that he didn't get to, you know, kind of retire and live for a couple of decades, you know, after his term as Secretary General and just to uh, enjoy his memories of his life in that period, you know, to die at that young age. And apparently this house also has an interesting history in that after Uthant uh, left here, it was kind of abandoned and it fell into disrepair. And then Uthant's uh, grandson came to see the house and he was upset that it was in such poor condition. And then he started a process and a movement to have the house, you know, renovated and restored and eventually turned into a museum. And I think a lot of that work was done by the uh, Yangon Heritage Trust. It's an organization that I've been hearing a lot about because I'm I'm not really a, an architecture kind of guy, but I do find the buildings here fascinating and the work of the Yangon Heritage Trust in maintaining these buildings and restoring them is quite interesting. They have an office uh, near where I'm staying and maybe when I'm out walking around one day, I can drop in and take a look at their offices. I think they offer tours, like historic tours of Yangon, but they are a little bit pricey at like $30, I think, uh, things like that. And I'm not that fond of tours. I'd rather just go look around on myself, um, by myself. This is kind of a simple illustration of some of the work that he did. Three folders, We've got the Cuban Missile Crisis here, the Congo mission there, and then miscellaneous uh, in the middle. <laughs> so two of the big events that he had to uh, deal with as a Secretary General. I like that lamp. That was very space agey. Very cool. Beautiful house. Nicely uh, restored. And from everything I've read here, it definitely seems like Uthant was something of an idealist 
you know, hoping for peace in the world, taking care of the environment, things like that. And some of these displays reflect that. For example, this one is uh, labeled wishes for the world. And then people can, you know, write down their wish for the world on one of these uh, post-its and then put it up on the, uh, the wall. I wish we all people don't fight and start wars. My only wish for the world is to be able to live peacefully and unitedly. There's a simple one. I wish for no poverty. And also very uh, simple and poetic. I wish that people don't fight about stupid things. It's kind of a fitting legacy for Utant, perhaps. And this is becoming a theme of my visit to Yangon. I saw one of these flags at the National Museum, and this is another one. It says, this flag was carried aboard Apollo 15 during the first extended scientific exploration of the moon. And then it was presented to Secretary General Uthant by the crew of Apollo 15. So again, it's quite something to think that that little scrap of uh, cloth went to the uh, moon and uh, came back again. I'm assuming that is the actual flag and then not a, uh, not a copy. This room talks about Uthant's early life and education, his first jobs and the path he followed into the government of Myanmar and then on to the UN. It's an interesting story. As I said earlier, he was born in a small town called Pantana in the Irrawaddy Delta, about 60 miles west of Yangon. Um, his father was the only man in the city who could read and write English. And when uh, Uthant went to school, he quickly learned English and he liked uh, English uh, literature. At the time, he was thinking about becoming a journalist, but then his uh, father passed away and he became the head of the family. You know, he could not afford to go to university as a student and study to be a journalist because he had to start earning money faster than that. And I guess he took a, a short two-year course and uh, became a teacher himself. And apparently he was quite good at it. He won a lot of awards in the field of education. When he was at uh, Rangoon University, he met uh, U Nu. You know, he became friends with this fellow called U Nu, and he be went on to become the uh, Prime Minister of Independent uh, Myanmar. So when he was Prime Minister, he, you know, remembered his uh, good friend U Thant and brought him into the uh, government, um, I believe as Director of Broadcasting, and then eventually as Secretary to the Prime Minister himself, and then eventually appointed him to the uh, United Nations. I guess he was a, a prolific writer and wrote uh, hundreds of articles over the years on a variety of topics. Uh, and he was very much in, uh, in favor of independence from uh, colonial rule, and that was a big part of his, uh, his thinking as well. My visit to the Uthant Museum has come to an end. There's one exhibit there I wasn't able to see. There was like a room that was like a multimedia exhibit where they show a film about the life of Uthant and his terms at the UN. But there were so many large school groups going through that uh, the children would crowd into that room. And being children, of course, they would watch the whole film intently from beginning to end. They weren't so interested in the uh, photographs and reading everything. But once you turn on a movie, of course, they were mesmerized and um, they just watched it over and over and over again. And it was a pretty small room, so I couldn't really get in to watch any of the movie, but that's all right. I got a glimpse of some of the footage and it looked like um, a lot of uh, repeated footage that I saw on YouTube already anyway, as I was preparing for this trip. One funny thing about this uh, museum though, is when I first went in, um, I was the only person there at the beginning, and I was chatting with the woman at the uh, front desk. And she said that if I had any questions about the people in the pictures, I could come ask her. 
I nodded and said, okay, yeah, if I have any questions, I'll come find you. But I didn't quite understand what she meant until I got into the museum itself and the walls are like covered in photographs of Booth Hunt meeting with world leaders, you know. But none of the photographs have captions. So <laughs> there's all these photographs, you know, him meeting Castro, Khrush Khrushchev, Kennedy, you know, a whole bunch of other people that I didn't recognize. And they're all famous meetings, of course, to deal, you know, to do with crises in the world. And yet with all the photos lining the walls, none of them have a, like a caption at the bottom saying anything. You know, Uthant meeting with Castro at this time or place to discuss this or that. There's nothing. Just a bunch of photographs with no captions. So if you didn't recognize the people in the photos, you really would have to go ask the woman, like, who is this? Who is Uthant meeting with here? And whose hand is he shaking in this uh, photograph? Of course, I knew most of the uh, people in the photos. I didn't have to ask. Just kind of funny that for a museum, they actually didn't supply any information uh, underneath any of the uh, pictures. Well, there's the long driveway heading into uh, Uthant Museum. And now I have to figure out a way to get back to uh, downtown. I asked for directions to a bus or bus station of some kind and the woman explained it to me, but all the words she was saying just kind of went in one ear out the other, a bunch of names that I didn't recognize. So she did say bus 61 is the one I'm looking for. I'm just gonna walk out of these uh, quiet residential streets here in Windermere compound and um, see if I can find my way back to some busy streets and maybe I will see some buses. If not, we'll have to grab it again. Doug's verdict on the Utant House Museum. Should you make the effort to come out here? I qualified, yeah, why not? I mean, if you have nothing else to do and you like to see a new part of Yangon and you're interested in politics and history, you know, you can come out here and see where he used to live and learn a bit about his life. But it's not that elaborate a display or there's not that many exhibits at the uh, museum. It's a little bit like reading an extended Wikipedia post, you know? In fact, I think Wikipedia the entry on Uthant had more information about him than was uh, present at that uh, museum. It was a very much a shortened version of his life at the museum, kind of focusing on his more idealistic tendencies and his accomplishments and presenting himself, presenting him as a, uh, a role model for the uh, children of Myanmar, that kind of thing. It's a place where uh, Teachers can bring their young students and show them that, you know, what they can accomplish in life. Coming up on a main road, seeing a few buses going by, so I might be able to hop on a bus here. And I think I'm coming up on the uh, bus stop. Actually, I saw a couple of buses pull over to the side of the road here. And Oddly enough, I think I even recognized the directions to get here from what the woman at the museum was telling me. So I think by accident, I ended up exactly where she was uh, directing me. Uh, it's interesting, they do have the uh, bus numbers up here on a sign, you know, the YBS bus service. But all the numbers are in the Burmese script, so I can't even uh, read it anyway. <laughs> So bus 61 uh, showed up and I don't know for sure if it's going where I want to go but I think so. I asked a young man on the bus and he said it's going to Sule Pagoda and it cost uh, 200 chat. <laughs> At a near tumble as I was running to get on the bus I fell in one of the uh, troughs beside the road scraped up my ankle pretty badly so I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So we'll see when I get back to the guest house uh, how much damage I did to my other foot. All my blisters are on my right foot and now I've uh, scraped up my ankle on uh, my left foot. This is one of the uh, older buses. 
I could probably have gotten on a newer bus, but the one bus number I know about is bus 61. As you can see, the uh, seats are pretty narrow, even for uh, two people, not much room. We appear to be heading in the uh, right direction. In fact, going right by the lake again, there's the uh, elephants that I saw the other day. at one of the main stops, uh, Sule Pagoda. <laughs> you can hear the air pouring out of this hydraulic system trying to keep this door open. Oh. There goes my bus. Old fashioned uh, bus 61. This is the exact same spot where the airport bus dropped me off. Time to check on my ankle, see how much damage I did. I don't think it's that bad actually. <laughs> Fell worse than, uh, than it actually is. Uh, it's barely even a uh, scrape, not even bleeding. I've just about reached the limit for uh, walking for today though with these uh, blisters starting to uh, limp. Got about a, uh, I don't know, kilometer and a half to get back to my, my new guest house. All roads lead either to Schwedegon or back to uh, Sule Pagoda, one or the other. I'm back at my guest house after my visit to the U Tant Museum. And I think as far as this video is concerned, that is the end of the day. I'm going to head upstairs, take a shower in my new room, cool down, relax, and uh, think about what adventures I'm gonna head off on uh, tomorrow. So, till then, I will see you in the next video. I was surprised to read on a TripAdvisor that this is ranked as the number two attraction in Yangon. And, uh, but I don't think that is from the point of view of a foreign visitor, you know, foreign tourists. She said they get so many local people and school groups come through here, you know, the numbers are so high that it becomes the uh, second large, the second most popular attraction, but for, you know, the people of uh, Myanmar. Yeah,